Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Hey, we're going to get in the word of the Lord tonight, and uh, I'm, I'm excited. I believe that God has given me a word for you and I tonight, and I believe that uh, we're going to leave this place encouraged, strengthened. We're going to leave this place uh, with something in our hearts that, that we're going to set out to do, that this is a, a, a very applicable word. This is a word where we get a hold of it, and then we get our boots on, and we go to work with it. And so I, I'm just excited to see what God is going to do tonight. And, and listen, you didn't come tonight to hear from me. That's not what this is about. Not about hearing from Pastor Luke, Pastor Deb, Pastor Jim. No, no, that's not what this is about. This is about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit. Because he is the teacher of the church. And so tonight, look past the, the mailman here. Okay, I'm just delivering the mail. That's all I'm here to do. This is about us coming and hearing from the Holy Spirit. So would you prepare your hearts? And let's go before the Lord in prayer. I'm going to get down on my knees. If you would, please stand to your feet. And let's ask the Lord to come and speak to us tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise for what you've already done in this place tonight, God. What an awesome and exciting time it is to live in, Lord, where your spirit can move and impart and give grace, God. And, and Lord, we thank you for the healings, for the provisions, for the encouragements that were already given tonight. And Lord, we don't want to stop there, God. We want to keep going with you. We want to go further than we ever have before. We want to go deeper, God. And so tonight, I pray that as we open up your word together, God, that you would open us up to receive it. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that understand, Lord, may we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. And God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Lord, touch us, heal us, encourage us, strengthen us, give us the guidance and the vision and the wisdom and direction that we need for each and every one of our lives. Lord, we thank you for that. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, also we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. We love them, Lord, and we bless them tonight as you would bless us. God, we don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we are your servants, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And tonight, as you have a seat, get your Bible and go with me to the book of John, the Gospel of John. We're going to be in John chapter number 13, and we'll launch from there. Tonight, I've titled the message, Expressions of Love. You'll see what that means as we go throughout the night tonight. But expressions of love that we see in John chapter number 13, starting in verse number 1. John chapter 13, verse number 1, we're going to read through verse number 5. John chapter 13, verse 1, starting, says this. It says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, we got to stop right there because I, I, I just get so encouraged when I read this. Here Jesus is. He's fulfilled his ministry on the earth. He's about ready to go to the cross. He's done everything that the Father has asked him to do, said what the Father has asked him to say. And now here he is looking forward to a road of suffering, looking forward to beatings, scourgings, mockings, being spit on, looking forward to being nailed to a tree and dying. That's what Jesus is facing at this moment. But rather than shrink back, rather than whine or complain, what does he do? He's there with his disciples, and look at what's going on. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, when I hear that, he loved them to the end, I, it just so encourages me. What did he love them to the end of? Well, really, the word could be said like this. He loved them completely. He loved them with everything that he had. He didn't hold anything back. He loved them fully. He loved them with a the love that only he could give. Why? Because he's the author of love. He is love by nature. Why? Because we find out in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. And so here Jesus is, love incarnate, love in the flesh, now loving those who are his in the world, his disciples, and he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end with an endless love. My goodness, so much could be said about this, but we got somewhere we need to go tonight. Verse number 2, and supper being ended, the devil having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Note that, we'll come back to a thought about that. Verse number three, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, 
verse number four, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Verse number five, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Quite an amazing picture that we see here. Just awesome to see what Jesus Christ does. Remember, it says that he loved those who were in the world and he loved them to the end. I'm reminded of a verse in Jeremiah chapter 31. You can stay there in John, but I'll put up Jeremiah 31, 3 on the overhead. It says, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Find out in the book of Romans chapter 2, verse number 4, that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. The goodness of God. God is, is forbearing. God is long-suffering. God is, 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 is just waiting for you and I to come to him. Why? Because he so loves us. And out of that love comes expressions of his love. Here Jesus girds himself, right? He, he, sit, he gets up from, from supper, really. Uh, some of the translations say supper being ended. Some of them say right in the middle of supper. Now it said before the Passover. So here it says supper being ended. Really what it means is that Jesus Christ is interrupting something. Jesus Christ is taking a moment. He's pausing the scene. He knew that there was a, a road that he had to walk. He knew that there was some things that he had to do. He had to set up some things. He had to institute some things. And, and yet before he could do that, he pauses and he stops, moved and, and motivated by love, and he takes some time. And what does he do? He interrupts supper. He interrupts everything that's going on. He stops the clock, basically, and he says, I've got something that I need to do here with my disciples, the ones I love, the ones whom I love to the end. And he, and he sets aside his garments, and he, and he girds himself, girding meaning wrapping himself in the waist area. He, he, he gets himself all fit together, tight in right here with a towel. And then he pours water into a basin, and he goes to his disciples, and he washes their feet with the water in the basin, and then he takes the towel that he's wearing, and he wipes the water and the dirt and the grime from their feet. Just amazed at this picture, what Jesus is doing. He lays aside his garments just as he did when he left the presence of the Father, disrobing himself of his glory. He girds himself with a towel, taking on the form of a servant. Here the king of glory takes on the form of a servant. And then he wipes his disciples' feet, removing the dirt from them and taking it upon himself, just as he did on the cross. He took the sin of the world upon himself. Now, we're going to see this as we go tonight, but God is, is doing something, and, and, and he's leaving us an example. See, Jesus lived on purpose. Everything Jesus did is a picture and an image of God the Father, and, and it's an expression of his image, and God is showing us something in Jesus that God wants us to imitate. God wants us to do these things. God wants us to be a part of this. Now, now some people have said, well, you know, Jesus wants us to go and actually wash other people's feet. Now, let me tell you, I've done that before. I was on a mission trip one time, and we had a foot-washing ceremony where we sat down with buckets of water, and we sat everybody around in a circle, and everybody in the circle, we didn't know what was going on. They said, take off your right shoe, you know, so everybody took off their right shoe, and there I was sitting next to like a six-foot-four basketball player, and he had some funky feet. <laughs> and they said, this person on your right, you're going to wash their feet. And I looked to my right, and here's this six-foot-tall basketball player with the funky feet. I looked to my left, and here's this petite little thing that feet probably smelled like roses, and I'm thinking, why couldn't I get her? You know, like, come on. What's going on here? And it is a humbling thing to grab a hold of someone's feet, especially when they're like size 13, and to wash them. See, I don't know that God necessarily wanted us to do that physically so some of you guys can relax. We're not going to break out the buckets of water tonight. <laughs> but I believe God wanted us to take on an attitude that Jesus Christ had. See, God wants us to follow Jesus, to follow his examples, to do the works that he did. It, it, the Bible says that we are to partake of Christ, to, to, to share in all that he was and all that he is. And the things that we see him do, we must also do. 
So the question tonight is, how do we express love like Jesus? How do we express love like Jesus? It should be the heart cry of every Christian on the planet to say, I want to have a love like my God had for me. I want to do things like Jesus did. I want to follow my king. I want to be like him on the earth. I bear his name. I bear his image. And therefore, I want to bear his works. I want to love like he loved because he loves perfectly. And therefore, if I'm going to love perfectly, I need to learn from his lesson and see the expressions of his love and then express love the way that he expressed it. Am I making any sense tonight? All right, good. So how do we express love like Jesus? A couple things I want to take a look at tonight. First thing is that we got to lay aside our personal agenda. If we're going to love like Jesus loved, we need to lay aside our personal agenda. Here's Jesus. Think about it. He's got some important stuff to do. I mean, he's, he's going to atone for the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. Don't you think that's pretty important to do? And yet he stops everything, halts it all, and, 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 and gets up from dinner. Now, Passover, Jesus says in the book of Luke, I, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you guys. I mean, he, he's passionate about this. He, why? It's a symbol of Jesus, the Passover once again. And so here he is wanting to express himself, wanting to break bread with them and say, this is my body, wanting to give them the cup and this is my blood and explain to them the new covenant realities. He's got things to do, places to go, people to see, a cross to face. And yet he stops everything and he interrupts all of the story of redemption of humanity so that he can express love to his disciples and show them the way that they should walk in. And he expresses his love to them. Gets up, lays aside his garments. If anyone had the right to be served, it was Jesus. Jesus is the king of glory. Here's God in the flesh. He should have said, hey, Peter, get up. Take off your garments, put on that towel, and start washing everybody's feet. John, James, come on, you guys. Sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. Go thunder over on them feet over there, all right? I mean, Jesus was their rabbi. He was their master. He was their teacher. This is the one who, who spoke and planets had existed, and now the one on earth who speaks and blind eyes are open, touches the sick and they're healed with a word, commands the demons come out, and they are delivered just like that. Walked on the water, and yet the feet that walked on the water, now he disrobes himself, and he's going to go and wash their feet. He should have been served. He should have been the one that was taken care of. He should have been, I mean, they should have been washing his feet, giving him a back rub. I mean, you know, just cleaning him, grooming him. They should have been like a whole bunch of monkeys on him, you know, just like picking at him and making sure he was just ready to go. And yet none of them took that position, and Jesus stops because he loved them so much. And he interrupts the plan, interrupts the road, interrupts the, the process, interrupts dinner. It says, here, here's what we're going to do. John chapter 13, if you drop down to verse number 12, it says, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? Now, a wise disciple would have kept his mouth shut at this point. Because obviously the master is teaching them something. He's going to reveal to them the parable that they just saw acted out right in front of them. Verse number 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Jesus says, you're right when you call me teacher and Lord. Just because I washed your feet doesn't change who I am. But I'm teaching you something. Verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So he says, if it's not beneath me to serve you, then it's not beneath you to serve one another. Remember, he's speaking to the disciples. These are the same guys who fought about who was the greatest. These are the same guys who saw some other people casting out demons in Jesus' name and said, hey, do you want us to stop them? They're not with us. This is an exclusive club. There are 12 of us. That guy's not one of us. The city's rejected. You want us to call fire down out of heaven? You want us to, we'll get them, Jesus. And yet here Jesus is, and he says, hey, guys, if I do this to you, you do it to each other. 
If I can humble myself and serve you, you can humble yourself and serve each other. Remember he said, he who wants to be great in the kingdom must become servant of all. Verse 15, for I've given you an example. I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse 16, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. In other words, you're not better than me, so get over yourself and go serve somebody. Go do something for someone. Go humble yourself. It's okay. I'm sending you to do this. I'm commanding you to do this. I'm teaching you how to do this. Verse number 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Wow. There's a blessing that's attached to us. Laying aside our personal agenda. Laying aside who we are. See, sometimes we get in this attitude like we're too good for that. Oh, you know, me personally, I could say, I'm a pastor. I don't clean toilets at this church. I don't pick up trash. And yet, if you walk behind me out there in the courtyard and I walk past a piece of trash, I may pass it at first because my mind is, is racing and I'm catching up with things. When I catch up and realize there's a piece of trash back there, oh, I'll go and pick it up. Why? Because... I take ownership of this place, and I'll serve somebody. I'll make sure that this place is clean so that when someone comes in, they're not going to see a dirty, trashy church. No, they're going to see the nicest, prettiest, most wonderful campus where they're going to meet up with Jesus. That's what this is about. It's not beneath us to serve. Not beneath us to go and help somebody. I love it when, when the men's ministries and the women's ministry have their event because you see this in action. The men always get behind the women's ministry, GNO. I mean, these guys take it like champs. I have seen them dress up in raincoats, slickers. They've had cummerbunds and bow ties. They've had, I mean, trays that they've walked around in. They've had the 50s diner caps. They've rolled their sleeves up. They've done all sorts of stuff in the women's ministry. And then when the men's ministry comes around and we want to go break stuff, they're out there putting flowers in the car parts that we put on the tables. They're out there helping out. They're moving stuff. They're cooking. They're doing things behind the scenes. They're, they're, they're telling us, hey, men, what's up, girls, right? Hey, men, we'll move those tables. You just watch. We're going to take care of it. And we, okay, all right, you know, we'll kind of back up. But what is it? Serving each other, laying aside our own personal agenda, not saying I don't do that. What if Michelangelo said I don't do ceilings? Hmm? See, what if Jesus said, I don't do that suffering on the cross thing, God. I'm too good for that. We'd all be dead in our sin. See, there's nothing beneath us as Christians. We need to go and we need to put aside our personal agenda. We're not too good because Jesus is too good. And yet he still did it, leaving us an example. Number one, if we're going to express love like God does, we're going to have to lay aside our personal agenda. Second thing for tonight... Second thing for tonight, following the example of Jesus' love, how do we express love like God does? Number two is that we are to take the form of a servant. Take the form of a servant. Remember, Jesus got up, he interrupted everything. He laid aside his garments, his own personal agenda, just like he did in glory. And what did he do? He put on a towel. He, he girded himself. He prepared himself. He, he, he wrapped himself up in the form of a servant. Here he was, naked from head to toe, except a little towel around his waist. How humiliating for Jesus, the one who should be wearing a purple robe and a crown with a scepter in his hand. I mean, this is our King Jesus. This is the one who was robed in glory, now just girded with a towel, walking out into the midst of his disciples. This is the teacher. I mean, this is just, this is wrong. This shouldn't be. And yet he still did it. And you and I, we've got to take on that form. We've got to take on that attitude. Change our mind about ourselves. Get rid of the prima donna stuff. I mean, just the, you know, we're so cool, we're so whatever. That's not what this is about. We must take on the mindset of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus. We're here to serve others. Not here to serve ourselves. God will take care of that which concerns us as we seek first his kingdom. But we're here to serve others. You're there in the Gospel of John. Turn me to the book of Philippians. Philippians will be in chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2, and we're going to read verse number 5 through verse number 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5 through verse number 8. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says this. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now let's stop right there for a second. What is that all saying? That's saying that Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, right? The Godhead, three in one did not consider it robbery to be considered equal with God. What does that mean? Jesus had no problem being Jesus and being God. See, there are some some people out there who don't believe that Jesus is God. They put him on a lower plane than God. He was a human God made and and you know, he because he lived this perfect sinless spotless life, now God exalted him, but he's not God. Let me t- tell you something. You can't read the gospels and read the claims that Jesus made without being confronted with the fact that numerous times Jesus said he is God. The very fact that Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, should make every person understand and realize that that is a claim to being God because he used the name that God gave to Moses when he said, who should I tell them sent me? He said, tell them that I am sent you. Now, here Jesus Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. I am what? I am God. Hello. And so Jesus had no problem with that. Jesus was there in perfect union and harmony with the Godhead. But look at what he does. Verse number 7. But made himself of no reputation. Really the word talks about emptying himself of all of the privileges of his glory. Completely taking it off. Made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. That word bond servant there, you could also translate slave. The lowest of the low. Not just bond servant. Bond meant slavery. Meant chains. It meant you didn't do your will. You did the will of your master. So here Jesus is the king of glory, disrobes himself of his glory, making himself of no reputation, emptying himself of all the privilege, and takes on the form of a servant, a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now the death of the cross was an offense. Why? Because, you know, it, it, it... if we were going to take a look at a way to die on the earth, we would have said, well, it needs to be quiet. It needs to be, you know, kind of hush-hush. You can kind of sweep it into a corner. There has to be this ugly thing called death. Let's not make it loud. Let's not make it, you know, public for everyone. Let's just put it in a room and make it as painless as possible. Maybe, maybe a lethal injection, you know, just, just let them fall asleep. And that's about it, Right? That's what we would do, and in fact, that's what we are doing when it comes to capital punishment and things like that. Now, we're not here to talk about that tonight. Let's talk about Jesus. What happened to Jesus? It was not painless. It was not private. It was not quiet. It was public. It was humiliating. Everybody knew about it. To the point where when Jesus came back and was talking to the disciples on the road, they said, where have you been? Haven't you heard what's been going on in Jerusalem? Why? Because it was so horrific that people were affected by it. My goodness, the Bible says that Jesus' form and appearance was marred so much that he no longer looked like a man anymore. You couldn't even recognize who he was. He was beaten so badly. It was an offense. And, And the Romans, here they were, the ruling reigning authority coming in, and the Jewish mind took a look at them, and these were the, the people who were occupying the territory at that time. And so for them to hang someone on a cross was like a double offense. It was a slap in the face. It was spitting in their face. Because now, here he is, not just being tried by the Jewish law, now being tried by the Roman law and hung on a cross. Such an offense. And yet Jesus, king of glory, could have called legions of angels to his defense, could have walked right through him like we heard about this morning. My goodness, what does he do? He humbles himself. And he dies on the cross. Takes that form of a slave. Now, if it's good enough for Jesus, oh, do you see where I'm going with this? If it's good enough for Jesus, if Jesus can humble himself to that point, what point does he want us to humble ourselves to? To death? Well, hey, if it's necessary, why not? Right? What a privilege to be counted that honor. 
And yet, I don't think in the American church we even understand the tip of that iceberg. So what is God asking us to do? Well, maybe he's asking us to, to, to go and pray for somebody. Oh, but I'll look funny if I pray for somebody. Yeah, you might, but maybe they'll get prayed for. Maybe they'll get blessed. Maybe they'll get healed. Maybe they'll turn their lives to Jesus. Maybe they'll see a miracle. Maybe, maybe they'll come to your church. Maybe they'll see love expressed, and the love of God will draw them, and they will give their heart and life to the Lord. Maybe God's asking us to give up something. Maybe God is asking us to, to, to disrobe ourselves of our pride and take that stuff that we've worked so hard for, money, oh my goodness, and give it away. Oh no, Lord, not my money. Our stuff. There's been several times where, where you know, we've just seen a need and we've said, hey, we know what God wants us to do. Bang, here we are on the scene. Sometimes it's money, yeah, sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's stuff that we have, clothing, different things like that. We see a need and we say, hey, I've got it. I've got the provision. Here it is. Why? Because everything we have was given to us by God. And therefore, if God gave it to us, then God, it's at your disposal, Lord. You want to use it? Here, use it. Take it away, God. Go ahead. Use it for your glory. God, I'm just your humble servant. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, in the King James Version, you can just take a look on the overhead. It says, for we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. See, that ought to be the attitude of every Christian. See, I'm not here to preach myself, even though I have a testimony and I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, not loving my life even unto death. It's not about me. It's about the Lamb. It's about Jesus. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves what? Your servants for Jesus' sake. How many more people would want to come to church if when they showed up at church, we said, how may I serve you today? And they say, what is this, McDonald's? And then when they do their, 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 their deed and they serve somebody and they help somebody and they say, man, thank you for doing that, we say it was my pleasure. And they say, what is this place, Chick-fil-A? My goodness. How many more people would come back to church? If we took on that attitude, see, I, I know it's funny to think about it in these, in these terms, but man, when Disney's doing a better job than the church. Amen. See, you're not a cast member. You're not working at Nordstrom's. You're trying to get people saved. This is so much more than making a buck. This is so much more than serving up a burger. This is about us bringing life and bringing hope, bringing help, bringing healing to our community, to our neighbors, to our families. My goodness, God wants us to reach out with the compassion of God, ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Well, again, I'll just put it up on the overhead. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, look at what it says. A bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. If you take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it just says Simon Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he says Simon Peter, and before he breaks out who he is, his title, his role, his rank, what does he do? He says, I'm a servant. Not just a servant, I'm a bondservant. I'm a slave. That's my job. That's my position. That's who I am. In fact, as you read through the Gospels and, and, and then you move, into, you move into the epistles, right, and you find the letters to the churches and the letters to the people scattered abroad, you start to read about it. John, Paul, Peter, James, and Jude all preferred this title before their position, their authority, or their link to who they know or what they're all about. They said, I'm a slave first, several times on several occasions. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. Jude, a servant, and by the way, I'm brother of James. You know Jesus' half-brother? But what did they say was important? No, not all that other stuff, not my title, not my priority. No, -uh, uh -uh. I lay that aside. I'm a slave. They take on that form. You and I, if we're going to express love like Jesus, we've got to take on the form of a servant. Last thing for tonight. Last thing for tonight, number three. If we're going to express love like God does, how do we do it? Well, number three, we've got to take on the needs of others. We've got to take on the needs of others. Remember Jesus, here he is, he's wrapped in a towel. And he goes to the disciples with a basin of water, and he washes their feet. Now that dirt doesn't all just wash off into the water. What does he do? He takes his towel that he's wearing 
that he's wrapped himself in. This is his clothes now. This is not just a towel that he had with him. No, this is what he's wearing. And if you can picture it, I know it's probably not this way, but when I picture Jesus in a towel, okay, for whatever reason, I picture him in a bright white towel. I'm talking like hospital clean white. You know what I mean? Like, um, let, let's try this, like Marriott Resort white towel. You know, when you go into the bathroom at the Marriott, and you get there in the nice hotel room, and then you go into the bathroom, because everybody likes to see what the hotel bathroom is at the nice hotel, right? And they go, ooh, look at the bathrooms. See the marble, see, you know, oh, look at the toilet with the golden handle and all that kind of stuff. My goodness, you know, and they're gawking over the shower head that we all wish we could have at home, right? Because it does like several different types of massage and sprays and all that kind of stuff. Oh, man, oh, my goodness. All right. So anyways, you go and you find that white towel, right? And it's fluffy, and it's soft. You rub it on your face, right? Because it just feels so good, right? Here's Jesus. Hey, here's Jesus disrobing, taking off his glory, taking off his robes. And he goes and he grabs that, that resort towel and he wraps himself in it. Bright white towel. Why am I harping on this so much? Because the moment Jesus goes and gets a hold of a foot of a disciple, and he gets a hold of that foot, let me ask you something. Did he have to take a Nike shoe off of the disciple before he washed it? No. Did he, did he take off a, a nice penny loafer dress shoe from the disciples? No. Was it even a, like a galosh, like a boot, rubber boot, you know, rain boot? It's okay to play with me tonight. Did he take off any shoes? No. What were they wearing? Sandals. What kind of sandals? Probably open leather Sandals. Have you ever smelt somebody's feet who's been walking around in open leather sandals? Not just that. They're walking through old Jerusalem. And remember, some of these guys had to go pick up the donkey to get Jesus on it to ride in. What comes with donkeys? They're walking behind them. These are not our everyday run-of-the-mill feet. This is not even the six-foot-four basketball player foot. This is disciple walking around Galilee to Bethphage to Bethlehem to, I mean, they were doing a circuit of preaching. They were walking everywhere. This is disciple. This is Galilean. This is fisherman. This is, I mean, come on. This is this foot. And here Jesus is washing these feet and then he wipes it on his resort towel. That's no longer a resort towel. Now that's a dirty towel. Now that's a stinky towel. But he wasn't concerned about his towel. He was concerned about his disciples. comes to Peter. Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Oh, no. No, no, no. You're the master. This is out of order, Jesus. Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you got no part in me. So Peter swings to the other side of the pendulum, right? And he says, well, then, Jesus, if that's the case, then get my hands on my head also, all right? Come on, let's go for it, Jesus. Let's just dive in. Just give me a bird bath right here. <laughs> Jesus says, no, those who need to be cleaned only need to wash their feet. See, we, we sometimes, when we take a look at this, taking on the form of a servant, and then number three, if you, if you want to remember where we're going with this, take on the needs of others. Jesus is saying, I'm taking your dirt on me. I'm taking your pain on me. The Bible says he bore our iniquities. And all of our sicknesses, our diseases, our punishment, the wrath that was being stored upon us, it was laid upon him. Oh, my. All of our filth, all of our dirt, all of our stench, all of our reproach, every crimson stain, all the blood that was on our hands. Now Jesus comes and he dies on the cross and he takes it upon himself. And he's no longer concerned about his glorious resort 
towel. He's concerned about you and about me. He's concerned about the needs of humanity. Why? Because he loves us. Why? Because he doesn't want us to stay dirty. Why? Because he wants us to have part in him. Why? Because Jesus Christ is expressing the love of the Father in himself. He laid aside his glorious robe and he made an exchange. He takes on our sin, takes on our stain, takes on all that, takes on the wrath of God for it all. And then he gives us his robe of righteousness. He says, here's the resort robe right here. Comes from paradise. Comes, comes straight from the heart of God. Here you go. Put it on. It's your size. I've custom tailored it for you. You're clean now. You're clean now. How does this translate? It means that no matter how dirty the path of the f- people's feet are that we come in contact with, God will bring you. I mean, we are in San Bernardino. I just started talking about a $300 room. Some of you guys, that's such a foreign concept to you. I understand that. I lived that for many years, but that's not an issue. The issue is, is where are we with God? What's Jesus all about? Jesus concerned with that stuff? No, he's concerned with our lives. And so when I come in contact with people, I mean, just yesterday, the rock stars were singing at the public library in San Bernardino. And my daughter was up there singing. But on the way in, I can't tell you how many people I passed that were sleeping under the trees with all that they owned right there with them and two cats. Laying on the grass in front of the public library. As we're sitting in the public library, here comes a couple of guys walking in, throwing up their gang signs as they're walking by. I'm sorry, do you think the church folk know what those gang signs mean? And I could take offense at that and say I'm too good for that. Or I could say, hey, I love you and I've got a sign for you. It's the sign of the cross. It's Jesus Christ that loves you. I can pray for those people that are laying down. And if they wake up and they say, man, I need something from you, I can say, hey, silver and gold I may not have at this moment, but I got something for you. I got provision for you. There's food for you. There's a church that loves you. And there's a God in heaven who will take care of you if you come to him. He'll take all that old stuff, that guilt, that shame, that stain. No matter how dirty these people are, no matter where their path has taken them and the stuff that they've walked through, we need to take it on ourselves. Sometimes we say, no, I'm just running in my lane. I'm not about that. This is, you know, hey, hey, I, 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 I can't take responsibility for them. Oh, but Jesus took responsibility for us. See, when I pray, this is my church. You say, but wait a second, this is not your church. This is, oh, this is my church. When I pray about San Bernardino, this is my city. But pastor, you don't even live in San Bernardino. I don't care. This is my city. And the people that are out there, those are my people. I want them, God. I want each and every one of them. I want everybody from the drug addict, from those people laying on the street, to the people that are up in the corporate offices. I want the doctors, the lawyers. I want all of them. Those are my people. Why? Because Jesus' blood is worth that. Why? Because the sacrifice and the price that he gave is worthy of that. Every seat should be filled, every church service, every time the doors are open. There should be a waiting line out there of people. There should be people out there in the courtyard. We need to put up the jumbotron, the big screen out there. We need to be broadcasting this thing. Why? Because Jesus' blood is worth it. He took responsibility for you and I. And now it's time that you and I take responsibility for someone else. I show this to you in the Word. You're there in Philippians chapter 2. We just read verse number 5 through verse number 8. Back up a couple of verses to verse number 3 and 4. Verse number 3 and verse number 4 of Philippians chapter 2. Last verse for tonight. says these words. It says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Verse number four, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, listen, the first part of verse number four, let each of you look out not only for his own interests. What does that mean? That means that you don't do this to the detriment of yourself. Why? Because you can't give what you do not have. And you have a responsibility by God to take care of yourself and your family. But look at what he says, not only for his own interests, 
Okay, so that means that you are not to be preoccupied with just yourself. Even though you've got to take care of yourself, you've got to maintain a job, you've got to work, you've got to pay the bills, you've got to take care of the family, you've got to pour your life into your husband or wife, your kids, right? You have a responsibility by God to do all those things. God knows that, God appreciates that, God understands that, God wants that for your life, but also for the interests of others. What does that mean? That means that when... You see the need when you see God wanting to express his love through you. And you start to feel the compassion of God. You start to, to feel that tugging on your heart. And, and, and you, you get that plan of action from the Holy Spirit that says, hey, they, they need some food. Doesn't your church give food? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. Well, hey, tell them. Tell them. When you, when you hear the, the people talking and you hear how lost they are, and they're saying, I wish I had an answer, and, and, and you see that they're so lost and so broken and so confused, and you, you start to feel for them, God, man, they're so lost. They, they just don't know. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And here God is saying, well, I am the good shepherd. Bring them to me. Invite them to church. Bring them with you when you come. See, not all of this has to be so extreme. Sometimes we think if we're not out there with, with nothing and, and we're not, you know, saving hundreds of thousands every day and this and that, then we're not doing the work of the Lord. That's not what I want you to walk away with tonight. What I want you to walk away with tonight is just that you put on the form of a servant. Just that you get that mind in you which was also in Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that he loved his own and he loved them to the very end. And when we start to get rid of our own personal agenda and get off of us and how cool we are, and, and we gird ourselves, we take on that form of a servant, and then we take the needs of others upon ourselves. Take responsibility. You, you're my friend. You're my brother or sister in the Lord. You're my neighbor. You're my coworker. You're my family member. When we start to take responsibility and we say, I, I don't have to do this, I get to do this. I want to do this. I love you with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all of a sudden, we're taking on the attitude of Jesus Christ. May not be our problem, but we might have the solution. Isn't God good? Yeah. Hallelujah. Tonight, three things that we learned. Number one, how do we express love like Jesus? Number one, we lay aside our personal agenda. Number two, we take the form of a servant. And number three, we take on the needs of of others. If you guys got something from the Lord tonight, come on, let's give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. Hey, I want to talk to you guys tonight. You guys were great tonight. We had some fun in the Word tonight, just some great times in the presence of God, singing God's praises. I really believe that you got something from God tonight. Let's not stop there. Let's make sure that before you leave this place that your heart's right with God so that if you died, that you wouldn't end up in hell that you'd go to heaven. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, isn't that convenient? Because, you know, the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. In fact, Jesus himself spoke about hell. Therefore, hell is a very real place. And just because you deny its existence doesn't make it any less real. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Well, go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway. You'll meet one face-to-face -face sooner or later. Just because you say hell's not real doesn't make it any less real. Sometimes people say, well, I appreciate what you're saying, Pastor, but you get to heaven your way, I'll get to heaven my way. We'll all get there the same. Somehow, all roads lead to heaven. Listen, listen, that's foolish. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Got to get there one way. Not going to get there on a road your way, some other person's way. No, not going to work. Jesus came and he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So what's that mean? That means it's God's heaven. You got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee way. It's not going to make it. Tonight, come on. Let's talk. Let's not play games. Let's talk about your eternal life. Listen up. Sometimes people say, well, you know, you said that, that, that we got to get there God's way. And I know God's way is by being good. I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds. Used to be bad, cleaned up my act, now I'm good. You know, done a lot of good stuff lately. Gave money to charities, helped my neighbor out. Been nice to people. I've been a really good person, and therefore, I'm going to go to heaven. Problem with that thinking is, could you show me in the Bible where it says how good you have to be 
to get to heaven. There's no grading scale in the Bible. I don't find how good you have to be, except if you're trying to get to heaven on your own, the standard's perfection. And the only one who is perfect, well, his name is Jesus. Not going to get there just by being good. In fact, the Bible says that if you try and get to heaven using your goodness, it's like filthy rags to God. It's going to be thrown out. Not going to make it just by being good. I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated. God is trying to speak to people about their eternal destiny. So if you can't stay still, please, please do during this time. Don't be a distraction. Sometimes people say, well, I understand that, Pastor, but you know I was raised in church. Parents took me to church, told me we were Christians. They hung a cross for St. Christopher around my neck, had me baptized or christened as a child. Took me to religious classes like Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class. And, 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 you know, born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America goes to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible say be raised in church, parents tell you, tell you you're a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere in the Bible do I see that your being born in America qualifies you for heaven. Come on. I love you enough tonight, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God says, oh, they're not any other religions, and so he lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. You say, but wait a second, Pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I'm church tonight sitting in front of you. And I consider myself to be a Christian. Well, you know what that's like? That's like saying, you know, you go sit in your garage and call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Doesn't matter how long you sit there, how many car noises you make, you will never be a car. You'll just be a person sitting in your garage. No one in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Check it out. Check it out. Sometimes people say, but I got involved in my last church, Pastor. I helped out. I carried the Pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church and taught the Bible classes. That's great. I'm glad you did that. But could you show that to me in the Bible where church involvement gets you into heaven? It doesn't work like that. No one in the Bible say help out, carry the Pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You teach in the Bible classes. You get to go to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God is looking for your membership card to a church before he lets you enter the gates of heaven. If that's how you think you're gonna get to heaven, I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth, you're not gonna make it. Come on, let's talk tonight. Talking about your eternal life. Sometimes people say, but pastor, I know God. I I know about Easter and the resurrection, sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures, Old and New Testament, tell you stories out of the Bible. I know God. Doesn't that make me a Christian? Well, no, as a matter of fact, it doesn't because if you read your Bible, the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell. Everybody look up at me for a moment. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having head knowledge about who Jesus is, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus made a statement to a religious leader of his day. This guy was a good guy, did good deeds, raised in his church, could quote the scripture, could sing the scripture. People thought of him as a leader. They looked to him to find out about God. He did a lot of good deeds, gave his money to the poor, gave his money in the temple. My goodness, we would have thought this guy was headed for heaven. And yet when Jesus speaks to him about his eternity, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, hey man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you there. No, what does he say? From John the third chapter, we hear Jesus say these words. He says, you must be born again. No, I know those words, oftentimes people think of what Hollywood has said about it or what the news media or things like that have said. This is not about what Hollywood, news media, pop culture, or anything else society says about being born again. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in Revelation. Last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's sitting, speaking to us here, sitting here tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little bit in, a little bit out. A little bit up, a little bit down. Token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. 
Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. I'm going to go one, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear that sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, but Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be, but get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet, tonight, your flesh is going to try and talk you out of it. The devil's going to be whispering in your ear, don't do it. Come on, tonight you can get right with God by simply raising your hand. Let's give God all your heart and all your life. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. So tonight, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never given God all your heart and life? Confess Jesus. Come on tonight, you can do that by simply raising your hand. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly church service. All across the side of Torrance, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at watching my television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, come on, raise your hand. And then either come into the church service or tell an usher right afterwards. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together again. Please focus in. This is for you. There's been some distractions tonight, and I need you to focus in. Ask yourself this question. Do I need to do this? If you don't know, if the answer is yes, if you're sitting there, wanting, come on, go for it tonight. All across this auditorium, I'm going to pop my hands together. Count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three up on top. There's four, five, six in the family room. Thank you. Seven, eight over here. God bless you guys. Eight, nine. I got you over there. Nine wise people all ready. There's ten back in that family room. See, there was a bunch of distractions right here in this section. And you all are sitting there like, I don't know. Hey, come on. If you need to do this, just pop your hand up. Anybody else real quick? That you need to give God all your heart and all your life? Anybody else? You know you need to do this. Just lift your hand up high and let me see it. Anybody else? I'm just going to take a moment that I did. Thank you. Thank you. There's 10. Got you right there. Anybody else real quick? 10 wise people already. I think I got, got you over here already. Praise the Lord. There's 10 wise people already. They're pointing... Gotcha, number 11. God bless you in this section. Anybody else in this section? I just feel like right here, you guys need this right now. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? If you know you need to, come on, don't wait. Just go for God. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about 10 or 11 wise people. Praise the Lord. God is so good to us. All right, all 10 or 11 of you, or if you're number 12, number 13, number 14, number 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to clap, give a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As we do that, we're all going to stand, and that's your opportunity. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, to get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you just come right now. Let's stand and welcome them. No one leave. Let them come right now. You come right now. Just come to the front. Come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. From the family room, so you can bring your kids down. Come on down. They're coming. Come on, you can come too. For you alone, every breath that That's you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Every moment I'm away. Hallelujah. Lord, Anybody else if you need to come? Come on, they're still coming from the family room. Let's welcome them as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. I'll live for you alone. All right, they're still coming as they come. Come on. Come on. They're still coming. Praise the Lord. So excited for you guys. All right, here they come. Here they come. Hey, everybody. Everybody, look up here for a second. Put a big smile on your face, okay? This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing, okay? You came to give God all your heart. came to give God 
all of your life. Some of you for the first time, some of you, you're doing it all over again. That's cool. That's okay. God loves you. He loves you completely. He loves you to the end. And he loves you with an endless love. All right, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really neat guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance. First thing he's going to do is he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again at that moment, all right? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, all right? Some free little booklets that our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Sit down, invest maybe a half hour into him. You know, even if you read slow, about a half hour, okay? Not very long, easy to understand. You need to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now, I'm gonna give you a hint about one of those things in a moment because the third thing he's gonna do is he's gonna give you absolutely free what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Now, you've been at the gym, heard of a physical trainer, helps you get strong, right? Make sure that you're working out right, eating the right things, that you're healthy, and that you're accomplishing your goals. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you here at the church spiritually. They'll, they'll come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible. That's one a week, real easy, real simple. That'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back to the junk that you came out of, that you go on serving the Lord, okay? Now, listen, I'm going to make a promise to you. You give us one year of your life here at this church. One year, 12 months, 365 days. You come to church consistently and sit under the word of God. At the end of this year, you will look back on your life and say, wow, look at what the Lord has done in me. I never knew it could be like this. That's my promise to you. Now, it all starts with five weeks with an SP. They'll help you to get started on the right foot. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.